Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. So today we enter into another discussion about rest, but we also enter into a series over the coming weeks and months in which Jesus is going to tell a bunch of different stories, parables. And the parable that he starts off with is known as the parable of the sower, or the parable of the farmer. Now, in our house, I am not the farmer, the gardener. No, no. I leave that to Alex and his little apprentice, David. In our house, the only plants that don't shudder when I come near are the ones that thrive on neglect. That is, the hostas, the rhododendron, the raspberry bush, and the fake plants. No, I don't have the green thumb. But every once in a while, I get it into my head that I, too, can grow plants. And so I go out and I buy those little starter discs. You know the ones I'm talking about? They come in the yellow box. They're about this wide and this big around. And what you do is you bring them home and you soak them in water and they expand out and then you mix up the soil in them and you put the seeds in them. And then the little uh, plants are supposed to grow out of them. And then you can transplant them into something bigger. Well, you know, what usually happens is I get them started and I take care of them for, you know, like a week, week and a half, and then Alex has to perform hospice on those seedlings. (laughs) Otherwise, they, they go to the very special place for those plants. So for me, this is not a parable in which I entirely relate, but that does not mean there's not something here for all of us. Because you see, in this parable, first we hear that Jesus has come down to a lake shore. Now, based on where this parable is sitting in the midst of Matthew's gospel, we hear that Jesus has just been with his mother and his brothers, so we can assume that he's down by the Sea of Galilee, and he's sitting there. And then all of a sudden, all of these people start crowding around him. First a few, and then more, and then more, and then more. There get to be so many people that he has to get into a boat and use that as a pulpit. Could you imagine if that happened here? I don't know where we'd put a boat. But I digress. So he gets into the boat, and he starts to teach. Now, I think the people in coming to hear him, they probably said to one another, well, let's go down and see what Jesus has to say. Because they probably thought that he was going to teach like the rabbis in the synagogue that they were used to. The rabbis who used to teach by pulling apart the very littlest bit of scripture. They'd get into the teeniest, tiniest little minutia, and they'd sit there and they'd argue about it and pull it apart for hours. So they must have been surprised when Jesus tells them a story. And the story goes something like this. Jesus says, there is a farmer, and he goes out to sow his seed. And as he's sowing the seed, he does so wildly. He throws it everywhere. He doesn't care where it lands. He doesn't have any idea where it's going to go. Some of it lands on the hard soil. Some of it lands on the uh, gravel. Some of it lands in the thorns. And some of it lands on the good soil. And the seed that lands on the good soil produces a hundredfold. Wow! That's some kind of farmer. Now, thinking about all of this, I actually had to do some learning. (laughs) Because this doesn't seem like any farmer that I would know. First of all, most farmers that I would know, what do they do? They prepare the ground that they're going to sow their seed in. They cultivate it. They make sure that it's all ready to go because they have only a limited amount of seeds. Well, this farmer, he's going out and throwing seeds left, right, and center. It's like he doesn't run out. 
The reason he doesn't run out is because this farmer is God. And the seeds, the seeds are uh, the knowledge of the word of God. The seeds are invitations to be in relationship with God. And the seeds are God's abundant grace, mercy, and love. God's throwing these seeds everywhere. He doesn't care where he, they land because God has enough for every person. God's going to throw them wherever in hopes that every person receives one. It would be like as if a modern farmer went and hooked up the planter to their tractor, threw all the seeds in, and then let down the planting mechanism while backing out of the driveway, going down the road and into the field. That farmer just planted the road on the way. He's not concerned about wasting seed. He's more concerned about making sure that it gets out there. So God is the type of farmer who is going to give the seed abundantly in hopes that it reaches some place, that it will grow into an abundant harvest. Now thinking about how that is our God, got me thinking, okay, well, now we've got all of this seed out there. Now we think about the second part of this parable, and we think about the different types of soil. So remember those little discs I talked about at the beginning of the sermon that you use to start your plants? Well, those are going to come back into play because they are a great example of all the different types of soil that we hear about in this parable. But before we really get into it, I do want to uh, talk about one other part of it. Because a lot of scholars will say that uh, each person is one type of soil that is mentioned in this parable. I don't think that's true, and here's why. Because if, if each of us was one type of soil, that would mean that God had chosen us to be either hard soil, gravelly soil, soil that had weeds and thorns in it, or good soil right from the start. There would be no chance to cultivate it. That's not the type of God I believe in. I think that all of us have each of those different types of soils in our hearts at different points in our lives. Each of us goes through different things in our lives that allows those different soils to come up. So thinking about all of that and thinking about those little discs, let's go through this second part of the parable. So the first soil that Jesus talks about today, he says, uh, the seed that landed on the road, the hard, hard soil, it's been compacted, it's been ground it's so hard that no seed is going to get into it, no matter how hard you push. It's like when you get those little discs and you first pull them out of the box. No matter how hard you try, you're not going to push a seed into that thing. No matter how hard you push and you trample on seeds, you're not going to be able to push them into the road. That type of soil is when we've allowed our, hard, our hearts to get hardened because of all the things that we go through in our lives. We've been ground down by the things of this world, things that we may or may not have any control over, the things that hurt us, the things that wear us down. And we're no longer able at that point in time to accept in the seed that God is trying to sow of grace and love and mercy. And so then we come to the second type of soil that Jesus mentions. Uh, the second type of soil in the translation that I used to uh, prepare, it said it is the gravel soil, or the soil that's kind of at the edge of the road where it's a little bit broken up. There's some crevices there, and the seed falls into one of those crevices. If you like taking that little, that little starter disc and maybe spritzing a little water on it, maybe scraping a little bit at the top, and you might get one seed into it, but ultimately, uh, even if you do everything right, that seed, it's only going to get a very shallow root to it. Any seed that falls in the crevice on the side of the road, it's only going to get a very shallow 
root to it. That plant is going to come up, but then anything harsh, sun, heavy rain, that plant's going to die because it doesn't have anything really grounding it. That's what happens to our hearts when we jump into something wholeheartedly at the very beginning, when there's a lot of joy and energy and excitement. But then the hard part comes when we have to keep it going, when the challenges come along with that and we have to maintain it. When we don't have that deep root, we're not able to do that and we fall away. So then Jesus talks about the seed that falls in the midst of the weeds and the thorns. Now think about it. If there are weeds and there are thorns, it's actually good soil there. So you could have taken that little disc that I talked about, done all the right things, uh, soaked it, spread it out, mixed up the dirt in it, put the seed in, but somehow something else has gotten in the midst of that soil. And as that uh, plant grows up, you have the weeds that grow up around it. And those weeds, they eat up all of the nutrients, all of the water, all of the good things that that plant needs to grow. That's what happens in our own hearts when we allow the things of this world to grab our attention. The need for security financially, the need for uh, approval, the need for all of the things that this world tells us are important, and the busyness of this life. And some of that busyness is to very worthy causes, but it chokes off our relationship with God. And the weeds come in and they choke off that plant. Lastly, we come to the good soil. The good soil that has been cultivated, it has been prepared. Everything has been done so that when it comes to that seed being planted, it is ready to go. That seed has every chance to succeed. It has a chance to have deep roots. It has a chance to grow tall. It has a chance to produce a hundredfold. It's when we take that little disc that we talked about and spread it out, have soaked it properly, spread out the soil properly, and then tend it properly so that the sapling can grow into a big plant. It's when we tend our relationship with God that a hundredfold comes out of it. So how do we cultivate, then, our hearts to be that good soil for God to plant his seed of grace and love and mercy in? I think uh, advice that was given to the Reverend Billy Sende is very good in this instance. He was told, spend 15 minutes every day listening for the voice of God. Spend 15 minutes every day speaking to God and spend 15 minutes every day speaking to someone about God. Those are the types of things like the sun and the rain and the watering and the fertilizer that help to cultivate the ground to make it a fertile place for a relationship with God to grow. But we've been talking about rest. So how does all of this then relate to rest? Because it seems like an awful lot of hard work, this cultivating, this knowing, this different soils, this planting of seeds. Well, there are many ways that it relates to rest. First, we can rest in the knowledge that God's never going to run out of seeds. That is, God's never going to run out of invitations to be in relationship with him. God's never going to run out of grace. God's never going to run out of love. God's never going to run out of mercy. But second, we can rest in the knowledge that God has not set us on one course of being one soil. We are not all destined to either be hard soil or gravel soil or thorny soil or good soil. We don't have to figure out where we've been predestined. We all have those within each of us. We all will cycle through them at different points in our lives. We have the ability to cultivate that good soil. 
And third, we can rest in the knowledge in cultivating that soil, that we do that in response to the knowledge that that seed of grace and love and mercy is coming. We do that in response to the love that God gives us. We rest in the knowledge that our God is the good farmer, the good farmer who wants to plant his seed within our hearts. And we rest in the knowledge that we are a place that he can do that. And all God's people said, Amen.